Well, my topic's autism spectrum disorder. When I started in this area over 40 years ago, it was one in 2,500 children. It was rare. Centers for Disease Control now say it's one in 80 children. A whole session would be, why is it so more readily diagnosed? Is there a genuine increase? But one in 80 is the current uh, rates that we would use. But with the NDIS rollout, what they've been astounded is the largest single diagnostic group for NDIS is autism spectrum disorders. Now, when we think of autism, we tend to think of a boy. If you have an Im image of autism, it's a boy doing a whole range of things. And the essence of ASD is a difficulty understanding people. That is the ability to make friends, read a face, all those sort of social skills that other kids are born with. Typical kids when born will look more at human faces than any other geometric shape. We are pre-wired to socialize. But there are some kids who aren't pre-wired in that way. Some with severe autism find other people totally bewildering, no idea, I'll stay away from them. And those with Asperger's ask me, how do I make a friend, how do I keep friends, and so on. So when we look at the gender ratio, it's usually quoted as four to one, four boys to each girl. But actually, it's two to one, because girls with Asperger's syndrome are smarter and more creative than the boys in coping with their social confusion. Now, diagnostically, we look at what's called the reciprocity, the social-emotional reciprocity. And what I mean by that is it's two extremes. Now, you've got a kid with ASD playing with his Lego. Group of kids playing over there. Kid says, mm, don't get it, don't like it, I prefer Lego, I enjoy solitude, it's being alone, not lonely. If they come close to me, I'll thump them and they'll go away, which is fine. Or they'll see the kids over there and they'll go in and go, OK, you do that. No, I'll tell the teacher. No, that's the way I do And they are bossy boots. They take control. So the one group are shy, introverted, and withdrawn. The other group in reciprocity are intrusive, intense, and annoying. I call them Italian drivers. Having been in Italy, actually, when I was in Italy a couple of years ago, with a group of Asperger adults, and I said, what's it like having Asperger syndrome in Italy? They said, hell. Because when you greet it, you go, mm, mm, mm. and when you're talking, they keep touching you. They said, we, we want to live in Japan. It's just, and that's it. You don't have to read faces, and that's it. So it's understanding conventions like Italian drivers that go through red traffic lights, faces at traffic lights, green light, smile, nod, I keep talking. If you showed an amber light, confused, what's he talking about? I'd slow down and explain. Red light, I'd stop. But they don't see the no tailgating and they invade your personal body space and all those sorts of things. But although that can occur in the sense of reciprocity, of either intrusive but not reading the signals and upset if they get it wrong, there's a third group that's not in the diagnostic criteria, which is how the girls cope. And the girls will go, wow, I don't get it. I don't understand it. But who's popular? Rachel. OK, how does she talk? I'll talk like Rachel. I'll move like Rachel. What's popular? Pink. Right, I'll make sure I wear pink. What are they playing with? Barbies. I'll get 100 Barbies. And so what she does is observe analyze and imitate, to fake it till you make it. She has a mask, a facade, that makes her highly successful in what she does, but it's a fake. It's done by intellect, not intuition. Now, when we look at this, we use the term ASD level 1. Oh, dear. DSM-5, the new diagnostic criteria, has replaced Asperger's syndrome with... Autism Spectrum Disorder, Level 1, Without Intellectual and Language Impairment. Isn't that brilliant? Why have two words when 10 can replace it? So, um, ASD Level 1, etc., is the same as Asperger's Syndrome, but it's the invisible end of the spectrum. The girls are there, but they don't want to be noticed. Now, I used to do clinics in Christchurch in New Zealand, and a local GP, Ruth Baker, used to sit in to watch what I was doing to carry on that work in Christchurch. And after four or five days, she said, uh, Tony, because um, there's nobody in the room but the two of us, she said, mm, I think I have Asperger's syndrome. 
To which I said, yes, Ruth, you do. <laughs> and, and indeed, Aspies make wonderful GPs. They really do, because part of being a GP is having phenomenal factual knowledge. And those with Asperger's are wonderful at recording and recalling factual knowledge and incredibly thorough. So if I want a GP, I want an Aspie GP. I don't worry about the relatedness. I'm not there for whatever reason. I'm there. What's wrong with me? What fix it? OK, bye. That's it. I'm out. And they also make wonderful surgeons and... Anyway, right, OK. Um, <laughs> with that um, surgical narcissistic personality disorder and so on. So, they think they're God. Um, however, as she called it the invisible end of the spectrum. It's there, but they don't want to be noticed. They fly under the radar by their coping and camouflaging mechanisms of observation and imitation. And they do that before they make the first step. There's a pathological fear of making a mistake. So that girl will be on the periphery of play, but avidly watching what's going on. Now, one of the essential components of ASD is a difficulty understanding the thoughts, feelings, and intentions of others, reading body language. And if you're not good at working out what someone's thinking and feeling, how do you get that information? By reading fiction. Because in the text is very clearly what someone is thinking and feeling. And so, as you're uh, reading Harry Potter, and especially Hermione, there in words, very clear to understand is what Hermione is thinking and feeling. And Hermione is the quintessential Aspie girl. At Hogwarts, she has no female friends. She's a total tomboy. It's interesting that J.K. Rowling said that that describes her as a child. One of the things that those with Asperger's are very good at is escaping into imagination and an alternative world where you're valued and understood. Hogwarts, and you identify with Harry Potter and all those sorts of things that become your escape. Or if she doesn't have a group that she's included in, she's on the periphery, she's poor in the currency of friendship, nobody wants to know you or include you, how do you find out about people? You watch soap operas of home and away and neighbours. In a voyeuristic way, you can then watch, you can replay it, freeze it, understand it, and then become one of the central characters. And you realize in her speech, she's using borrowed phrases from television. And when she imitates, she imitates in the accent that she heard it. Many girls with Asperger's syndrome sing in perfect pitch and develop a talent in languages and speak the language they are learning without expressing their native accent. They make wonderful spies, but that's another story. <laughs> so they have that ability to uh, understand what people are thinking and feeling by fiction and television. Or she has a hundred Barbie dolls all lined up in hairstyles. Now, she doesn't play Barbie getting married. She plays Barbie's teacher. This Barbie's her. The other Barbies are the kids. And so in her solitary play, she is decoding and analyzing the social events of the day or rehearsing what to say or do tomorrow with the Barbies being the characters. Now, the boys are playing with, with, with trucks and, and dinosaurs. That's not going to tell you about people. But if you've got lots of dolls, oh, that's a very girl thing to do. But she's using that in a different way to understand reality, not necessarily total fantasy. Now, a risk in ASD is making social faux pas or mistakes. Um, these kids are self-appointed revealers of the truth. And they will spot your mistakes and point out your mistake. And you should be grateful to them for your mistake being pointed out. So they have that natural ability. But if a boy makes a social mistake, he gets upset, explosive, annoying, abrasive, he's referred. Whereas a girl will make a social mistake. Oh, I'm so sorry I talked about your BMI. Yes, I do know you need to go on a diet. And I am very concerned about you, auntie. But when you put those potato chips in, the, and, and when your face went red, I didn't know whether it was embarrassment or menopause, etc. <laughs> And I'm so sorry I've upset you. Be but because she apologizes, we forgive and forget. But the point is, she didn't know. But she's got a remarkable way of recovery. Or she appeases people 
by mum may arrange a, 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 a birthday party and says to her, it's a birthday party with your cousins, you, you've not known your cousins for many years, they're almost strangers to you, will you be okay? Yes. Now, you sure, because um, I will be away with your brother because I've got to take him to soccer, you'll be on your own for three hours, will you be okay? Yes. But look at the terror in her eyes. She won't let on, and she's incredibly brave to cope with it. The boys will either do oppositional defiant disorder, which is a pompous way of saying you won't do as he's told, but psychologists and psychiatrists won't say that because people could understand it. <laughs> so, um, so she apologizes and appeases, or she's like a chameleon, and she adopts a persona to fit the situation. And in particular for the girls, there are two, school and home. So when she's at school, she's a goody two-shoes, she's wonderful, she's brilliant, teacher likes her because she dobs in all the rest of the kids, <laughs> gives her all the information, etc., and helps her, but when she gets home, she has suppressed her emotional despair and confusion socially, and then downloads it on mum. Some her child I saw recently this week, she said, mum said, the moment she gets in the car, the expletives, the comments, the things that she says or done, but she's an angel in class, but a devil when she gets home. And there's that mask, and that mask is successful, very appealing. You fake it till you make it. It's Emily Mars in public and will melt down the second she's out of the situation. A Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And she's got the ability to fake it, which means diagnostically, when you see her, she knows the script of what to do. And when you watch her body language, you realize it's stylized, it's contrived. Um, one girl I was seeing, she, a question was just going, oh, no. oh, yeah. and, and giving such wonderful, vivid gestures, but they were exactly the same every time. They were fake. But they were learnt and successfully masked the problem. Girl doesn't want to be noticed, so she's less disruptive, and quote, we think that if we are very, very good, people will like us and all will be well. I don't want to be noticed. And learn that if you're good, you're left alone. Now, for the girls, uh, yeah, they have their special interests as, as part of the actual syndrome is that. Because the syndrome includes social confusion. My definition of Asperger's is very clear. It describes someone who in life has found something more interesting than socializing but they live with social zealots. So a characteristic is, yes, the social confusion, its routines and repetitive behavior, high levels of anxiety, so you impose routines and rituals and so on. But you have special interests. Now that interest may last hours, it may last decades. With the boys, yeah, it's Thomas the Tank Engine and all those sorts of things. But for the girl, it may be horses. And people will say, oh yeah, but lots of girls like horses. But it's July, and she's moved the mattress into the stable. And this is so dominant. All she thinks about is horses, horses, horses. Um, actually, I saw a family the other day. I saw the brother, Asperger. Uh, he's going well. And they said, oh, by the way, a couple of years ago, you saw our daughter. And I said, oh, yes. Yeah. She said, you said at the last clinic appointment for her that this appointment will be the most expensive clinic appointment you could ever imagine. And I said, did I? I said, yes. They said, yes, you did, because you said, she needs a horse. <laughs> and we did. And here's a picture of her, state dressage champion. <laughs> and she really relates to the horses, her best friend, and she's highly successful with animals. It's either machines or animals, but not people. But what the girl may do is, if you haven't got real friends, you have imaginary friends. And you talk to the imaginary friends, and you have tea parties for them. And you have a way of relating to an imaginary world. Because if you're not valued and accepted in the real world, it's the imaginary world of imaginary friends. For the boys, it can be Star Wars and Star Trek. It can be another planet. It can be anywhere else but here. So as far as this person is concerned, I must find an escape into imagination. And some of those girls escape into imagination by reading fiction, writing fiction, and become successful authors. But in imitation, it's absorbing 
and observing the speech, mannerisms, character, even persona of someone who is successful. You become a mimic. Popular with the peers, because you can do various people's voices. You can do the chemistry teacher's voice or voices of people on television. And actually enjoying and using speech and drama lessons which are used as this is your role, this is your script, this is the person you'll become. The real you must be hidden and must be hidden because they may not like the real you, but you have now created a persona that you must maintain. Again, talking with a teenage girl with Asperger's last week, she said, I, I've got this fake me, but, but do I let other people into my real world of who I really am because they may not like me? Do I keep up the pretense? And I said, if you do, you're going to get actually quite depressed because the amount of energy that goes into that fake person is going to destroy you, and also the feeling that the real me is that despicable, I've got to hide it. So it's learning how to act in real social situations. Quote, I'm an expert mimic and have used this to survive. I was previously diagnosed with multiple personality disorder. And so some personality disorders, narcissistic, schizoid, etc., can be the person's coping mechanisms of their social confusion. I try to be who they want to be, me to be, but I can't reveal the real me. I could take part in the world as an observer. I was an avid observer. I was enthralled with the nuances of people's actions. In fact, I often found it desirable to become the other person, but by observation, analysis. That person may try to understand people, they're intelligent, so they go to university and study psychology. Yes, quite a few of my psychology colleagues are Asperger's because their view was, I've got to analyze people, the study of people is psychology, and I recently wrote a foreword to a book written by a budding psychologist with Asperger's and said he became a psychologist at the age of three years old by observing and analyzing people. What I want ultimately is psychotherapy designed by Aspies for Aspies, administered by Aspies. <laughs> because their biggest challenge is look at me and tell me. What were you feeling at that time? Don't know. What are you feeling now? I don't know. I shall now complete the sentence. I don't know how to grasp the many negative thoughts and emotions in my mind. Hold one, label it, and explain it in speech so that you will understand. So the person has very great difficulty in disclosing inner thoughts and feelings. I was uncanny in my ability to copy accents, vocal inflections, facial expressions, hand movement, gaits, and tiny gestures. It was as if I became the person I was emulating. That is the cure. That is the way to cope. That is the way of escaping Asperger's syndrome. But it's the exhaustion. The first autobiography was by Leanne Holiday Willie called Pretending to be Normal. I have done such a great job of pretending to be normal that nobody really believes I have Asperger's. Again, when you meet that person in a clinic or GP surgery, you think, ah, oh, they're so good, they're so engaged, they have lovely eye contact. But what you find is, when you're talking to the parents and she's in the waiting area, she's fast asleep because she's absolutely exhausted, or after a while, the wheels fall off and you suddenly realize she can't cope with it anymore and the real person is starting to come through. We have literature now specifically for girls. This is a book of first choice for the girls, Asperger's by Rudy Simone. She has Asperger's syndrome. And she goes through the characteristics because most of the information is the boys' representation. And the girls are there, but they're better at camouflaging and compensating. Now, if we're dealing with classic autism, um, we are now di diagnosing such kids younger and younger. And for GPs and others, there are now screening tools we recommend to identify the characteristics in kids as young as 18 months, where there's a certain language, social, emotional, sensory profile that we can pick up with a fair degree of accuracy at 18 months, the characteristics of ASD. We can actually spot it now with even younger kids, the youngest I've ever diagnosed, well, not formally, but wrote in the notes, concern, was three weeks old. Because even at three weeks, there's a degree of social engagement. And there were major deficits in that, and that, now the child is seven or eight years old, is confirmed. 
So classic autism can be diagnosed younger than 18 months, six months, we're not sure, by a year, we can be pretty sure if you know what you're talking about. Asperger's in boys often now at primary school because at home when they were younger it wasn't so obvious but now they're with their peer group as far as the kid with Asperger's is concerned. When he goes into the playground at five, six, seven years old it's not to discover the social world and enjoy the social world. He goes into the playground to discover the school's plumbing and drainage system <laughs> and the shapes of the clouds and if they want in fact, what they're liking is not social information, but intellectual information. Where do you get that from? The library. So if I want to know which kids have Asperger's in a school, I go to the librarian, and I say, who's in the library at lunchtime reading about the Titanic, volcanoes, etc.? For this kid, knowledge from the library, and it's an Asperger-friendly environment, or you get information from adults because they know answers to things. So as far as this person is concerned, kids my age, stupid and boring. Now, high proportion of the guys here have anxiety disorders. One thing that those with Asperger's are very good at is worrying. And that level of anxiety can be generalized anxiety, phobias, often for sensory experiences like dogs barking, <laughs> not going near dogs, not because they've been attacked by a dog, but they may bark, not going to birthday parties, not because of the social, because the balloons that could go pop, not enjoying the playground because kids shouting to each other, and the shouting is aversive to that individual. So there can be an anxiety disorder from separation anxiety to specific phobias. Depression, because of the exhaustion of trying to socialize, low self-esteem. Borderline personality disorder. Some of the girls may have as a special interest friendship, read about it, observe it, analyze it, have talents in art, draw in photographic realism, anime and manga, very good with animals, and so the kids are attracted to them and they start to make friends and then lose them. A characteristic of ASD is then a tendency to catastrophize your emotions. So in other words, there's been a history of intense interest in a person, and when that relationship ends, catastrophize, and the view of borderline personality disorder or eating disorder, for that girl does not want to become a woman. She wants to remain androgynous, and anorexia nervosa may help maintain that. It may be to be popular, you need to be thin, so she thinks that if I am thin, I will be popular, or she develops an OCD around numbers, calculations of BMI to three decimal places, and how many kilojoules, etc., in food, and numbers are totally consuming for that individual. Selective mutism is quite common. But a detailed developmental history indicates Asperger's. Now, characteristics from 5 to 12, doll play to replay the events, but it lasts longer. I played with dolls until I was 14 years old, not because of emotional immaturity, but in private she could use dolls to replay and decode social situations. Gender-specific toys. I loved playing with Lego for years and had many thousands as a child. I also loved cardboard boxes and drawing and writing. I always ignored the dolls I was given, so there may not be the typical gender identification. Tomboy. It was easier to identify with boys because they just wanted to have fun. Girls had more social rules to follow or blunder. They had more gossip and didn't like to get dirty. The guys were fun and I could almost be myself around them. I don't know how to do girl things. And the boys are delighted to have captured a girl and if she doesn't know, she's a girl, we'll explain it to her. So those are the things that can occur. Um, being a tomboy is socially acceptable in the pre-puberty years, but less acceptable after puberty. You're an it, as far as uh, the school kids are concerned. I just, well, okay, hang on, that's it, the next one. Now, what the person may do is try to fit in the primary school by observing the social conventions and rules, fake it till you make it, pink and frilly. And when they're teenagers, they can either be goody-two-shoes puritanical nun, that wouldn't say boo to a goose and want to just disappear into the crowd, or their view is, I walked the walk, I talked the talk, I worked out what the rules were, I did it, but they still didn't accept me. So, you lot, I'm going off the rails. 
I'm going to take drugs. Promiscuity? Yeah, well, at least I'll be popular, etc. So may despise femininity and defy social and gender conventions and want to be just breaking the rules. And some with Asperger's, male and female, can socialize very well, can be the life and soul of the party, but by intellectual effort, not intuition, that's exhausting. It drains me mentally and physically. I'm exhausted after having spent a lot of time with others, and I need to recover in solitude. So for this individual, as far as they're concerned, I can be like Cinderella at the ball at midnight, but after two hours, that's it. Tomorrow, under the covers, in the cupboard, social migraine, don't want to see anyone. But for two hours, I did it. I was fantastic. As Caroline said, I relished isolation and solitude, and when I was by myself, I thoroughly enjoyed the company of an empty room. So this person needs islands of tranquility and solitude throughout the day. When you're at school, how can you ever be alone? But emotional instability, meltdowns, and the tragedy is an event that occurred in Sydney about two weeks ago of a woman with Asperger's outside Hungry Jack's who was having a meltdown. And unfortunately, the police did not follow the instructions we have for dealing with a meltdown with that individual. Consequence is she lost her life, but she was going through a meltdown. There are certain do's and don'ts, and unfortunately, that led to her death. But what can occur, five minutes, is if something happens to make me happy or upset, then I quickly become extremely happy or upset. I don't have many intermediate states, and I find it almost impossible to moderate my internal emotional state. I'm extremely sensitive to emotional atmosphere. Uh, I think that's fairly easy to read. I'll zip over that. Oh, special interests. Yes. It's what I call an intellectual orgasm. It's something that that person does that's better than any interpersonal experience. Uh, I remember seeing a GP once with Asperger's syndrome who was depressed. And the reason he was depressed, he was collecting insects, a particular type of insects in Australia. And he was collecting them and collecting them. And there was one missing. And one day he found it. Yay! But what's the point of life now? <laughs> what do I do? I found it. That's the last beetle. Oh, no. Right. Um, I was never interested in dolls or maternal things, but spent hours catching small fish, tadpoles, amphibians, and insects, and keeping them in aquariums. If you want to meet Aspie women, go to Australia Zoo. OK. Uh, I collect potato mashers. I think I have something over 500, all different. I know other people normally don't get excited about potato mashers. <laughs> However, sometimes I can tell by the time they spend looking after some of my potato mashers and how they handle them that they are interested. This is why the British have always understood Asperger's more than any other nation. <laughs> you see, if you collect and display toilet brushes through the ages, in other countries you are diagnosed with, shall we say, psychosis and anal fixation. Whereas in Britain, the BBC make a documentary about you, and you appear on the Antiques Roadshow, which I call Spot the Aspie. Now, um, sensory perception, yep. Reading body language is a real challenge. Oh, maybe that's a, a what? When listening, I need to watch their mouth to gain the most understanding of what is being said. When I'm talking, I cannot keep my thoughts together and coherent. If I try to look at people's eyes, people interpret this as guilty or a whole range of things, but actually it's not reading the messages in the eyes. It is hard to think or listen when trying to maintain eye contact. If I focus on their eyes, I cannot focus on the rest of their face and so could miss expression. I know I'm supposed to look, but it doesn't tell me anything. Okay. Uh, friendships from other cultures, yep, that can occur. Very prone to bullying and teasing, one of the major causes of depression. Clothing and fashion, wanting to wear boys' clothing because it's comfortable, big pockets, cheaper. Now, what I've, I have learned is that women wear clothes and fashion to impress other women, not men. Men are more concerned about catching a glimpse of what's underneath the clothing. <laughs> but this girl just doesn't get it, and so she's not cool in the currency of friendship. What, is it one minute? Two minutes, OK. Girls' clothes fit better, but I always try to find androgynous ones. Guys' clothes are generally more practical. I like jeans and shirts because I don't have to think about what to wear. Clothes styles don't really interest me. I feel odd when I dress fashionably, and I'm not sure whether I am overdressed or underdressed. 
As one teenager said, when I wear fashionable clothing, I feel like a man in drag. I don't get it. Um, okay. Oh, I think that's... I like to wear the last one. Either baggy pants or skirts. I love to dress in my ballet outfits, and I have a few fairy outfits. That's a woman. And she just likes wearing fairy outfits. She knows in private. Uh, makeup and perfume. Um, I don't care about fashion or hairstyles, and I stopped wearing makeup once I got married. Hmm. Yes, I've got the prize. Sign the certificate. That's it. Don't need to try anymore. But it's the vulnerability. They're not good at understanding character. They don't have a group of friends to go out with who are good at character judgments for the good guys and the bad guys. They are intoxicated by the interest of the boys, and the risk for this group is date rape. They didn't read the signals, low self-esteem, etc. Not recognizing that boys may be flirting and knowing how to respond. Sex has never interested me. I have never felt sexy and certainly never wanted to look sexy or glamorous. Even as a teenager, I felt left out because my peers were becoming sexually aware and I felt nothing. Many of the girls with Asperger's become romantically sexually aware about five to ten years later than their peer group. And because they're not interested in the boys, they're accused of being gay. And then they become totally confused in terms of gender identity and sexuality. I set my expectations very low and as a result gravitated towards abusive people but may have pets for emotional support. That's one minute? That's it? Ah! Um, okay. That's a good one. Uh, that's it. Uh, gone. Okay, thank you.